And uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, that was a great family moment, huh? We'll be talking a little bit about that this morning. Great family moments. And uh, thank you, Richard. And, uh, yeah, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. How are you feeling this morning? So, like, I, I drank this, I've been telling a few people, I drank this cup of coffee this morning. I always drink a cup of coffee in, this morning, uh, in the morning, but that's, that's not the issue. The issue is that I didn't, I didn't eat anything else, and it kind of sat in the wrong way, you know? <laughs> yeah, but uh, other than that, I'm feeling okay. Yeah, and you? How are you? Hey, I noticed uh, Bella. Bella is there talking with her friends. Bella is back. Remember, we prayed for her. She did her short-term missions. I thought you were going to be back, gone like, uh, I don't know, two months. Her mom says, no way. <laughs> Welcome back, Bella. Glad to see you're okay. Yeah. Well, uh, this morning we're continuing our um, series that we started on the passion of Christ, um, <coughs> from, but from the perspective of the words of Jesus from the cross. And the word from the cross today is relationship, relationship. And the passage I am going to read is from John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. They're always short, right, the passages? That's why I start anyways. But uh, John chapter 19, uh, maybe find it in your Bible and you can look at it a little bit later. But it goes like this. When Jesus saw his mother there... And the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Just for the sake of clarity, I'm talking about John here, the apostle John. This was written in the gospel of John, right? And I guess he didn't like talking about himself or whatever, right? But uh, that, that's who, it, who Jesus is talking to. The implications here are obvious, pretty easy thing to understand. Uh, it was important, especially in those days, for children, especially the eldest child, to take care of their parents. And uh, the fact that Mary was uh, the Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, had become a widow. We don't know how many years, but certainly uh, before the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. <clears throat> uh, you know, Mary became a widow, uh, makes this point even more uh, important uh, to take care of parents. Now, I have to be careful what I say because this is uh, recorded, obviously, and I know my mom is listening to this, or at times she listens to this, but uh, we have been thinking about this issue of uh, taking care of elderly parents uh, for some time now. And in fact, uh, this is one of the reasons why we bought the duplex that we have, because it ha there's an apartment on top and it gives the option anyways. Uh, if anyone has any ideas on how I can now influence my parents to come over here and live, uh, come and see me. But, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly a, s a subject that we have been thinking about for some time. In our Canadian culture of independent thinking and government programs and, you know, even we could blame it on, uh, you know, uh, parents these days have uh, retirement funds and all kinds of things. Well, because of all of that, we feel like taking care of our parents is not as important. Look at the way I started the subject. Well, in those days, it was important, but not so today, right? But th that's not true. It is important, and that's the reason why I feel that we need to kind of pause here for a moment and take a look at what Scripture has to say about this subject. And then I'll, then I'll tell you how it relates to, um, well, Jesus on the cross. So, you remember the, I say do you remember because I mentioned this point before in, uh, in another sermon. The reason why God punished the Israelites by sending them, by exiling them, by sending them out of the promised land. Uh, there are three reasons, and those reasons are listed over and over and over. If you were to, if you have a reading plan, 
um, of reading through the Bible in a year or whatever, or if you alter that plan and just read through all of the prophets, you're going to get the point because it's all over the place. Those three things are idolatry, religious ritualism, and not caring for widows and orphans. There it is. And that point is mentioned over and over in almost every single prophet of the Old Testament. I'm going to give you just one example from Isaiah chapter 1. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, flattened, you know, like there's nothing there, <clears throat> like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, we, we would have become like Gomorrah. Now, this is the, um, the prophet Isaiah who is talking about the northern kingdom. You remember the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom was separated into two kingdoms, okay? So he's talking about the northern kingdom and he's saying, see, look at ha what happened with them. Look at what happened with them. They're completely punished by God. And, uh, and he's saying, you be careful now, southern kingdom, because the same thing is going to happen to you, basically. That's what he's saying. But let's c continue reading. And by the way, I'm, I'm reading kind of a selections of this passage. You can read Isaiah chapter 1 yourself, all right? So, <clears throat> hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Okay, it's not starting well. He's not talking to Somo Sodom and Gomorrah. He's talking about to the southern kingdom. But he's already, you know, calling them Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's continue. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of ram and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the, bull, the blood of bulls and lambs, and goats. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Okay, you get the idea that maybe God is a little annoyed here at something. So the chapter actually tells us why he's annoyed. And we continue reading, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the father, fatherless, plead the case of the widow. There you have it. And that theme is repeated over and over. I might as well finish the part. Right after that, it says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, we've heard of that verse before, but we forget about what the reasons are. What is the big sin? Well, one of them says, You need to plead the case of the widow. So that's not all. all. Uh, that's not all, because this theme started all the way back with Moses. Moses says in Exodus 22, do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you, do not, if you do and they cry out to me, says God, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your, your children fatherless. Pretty direct language here. Right? But the destitute or destitute um, elderly people unable to work and care for themselves was such an obvious problem in the early church that it became one of the first ministries that, you know, the early church organized. And uh, so we can look at Acts chapter 6 as an example. The, uh, here, uh, they're in the middle of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's thousands of people that are joining this uh, new, uh, the new church. And, uh, and even there's persecution. The persecution uh, from the Jewish leaders. There's persecution from the Roman government. And, and in the middle of all this, the early church is already busy creating a new ministry. Uh, like the ministries that they think are the most important and, and one of them is uh, ministry to widows. Look what it says in Acts chapter 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic or the, the Greek Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because 
their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So they're distributing food every day to take care of widows. And so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, I would, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables, brothers and sisters. Choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So uh, they chose people and they were now in charge of this ministry. That's, that's how, so in the middle of persecution, in the middle of everything that was happening, it was so important that they do this to take care of widows. Uh, throughout the New Testament, we see the same idea. I'll read just one passage, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Again, I'm sorry for the directness of these, these passages. I, I didn't write it. So, um, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Woo! Anybody saying ouch out there? Oh, this, 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 are, you, are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. So Jesus is the only one that I didn't mention. Okay? I kind of covered all of Scripture. I just didn't say anything about what Jesus taught. And I'll read that in Mark chapter 7. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and in anyone who curses their father or mother is to, be, is to be put to death. Yes, this is what we believe. Honor your father and mother. We should do that, right? But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother, speaking of money, is Corbin that is devoted to God. In other words, they were making like pledges to the temple. There was this little law, a tradition uh, that, uh, that they had created that if you uh, pledge money towards the temple, you know, uh, to support the, the, the worship of God and to support the temple and the priests and all that, if you do that, then, then you're not allowed to spend that money on anything else. It's pledged to the temple. Well, they figured out a cute little way of avoiding giving money to their parents. Uh, they would just uh, take extra money that they had, and they would pledge it to the temple. And as soon as they did that, then, oh, oh it's pledged to the Lord. It's pledged to the temple. I can't give it to you, uh, you know, my parents. And so Jesus says, like, what are you doing? And then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. So uh, you, you say that you're following the law, but you're actually not. Now, are you with me again? Yeah. So why am I talking about this? So uh, we're supposed to be talking about the passion of Christ, the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And here I'm talking about caring for parents. And maybe you're thinking uh, maybe we should get back to talking about, you know, God's cosmic solution to sin, rather than these personal matters of, uh, you know, should we take care of our family members and should we take care of our parents as they age? Well, if you're listening to what I've been reading, and I read quite a bit, I spend a lot of time on it, and I, I kind of gave you a quick overview of what Scripture has to say on this subject, you will know that what I'm describing here is the heart of God. I mean, isn't that the primary way to know the heart of God is to see what is taught in Scripture? And this is taught all over in Scripture. And so, isn't it true that this could be describing the heart of God? No, not only that, but the incarnation of the heart of God, the enfleshment of the heart, the actual heart, the beating heart of God is pinned against a piece of wood right now. And Jesus believes that it's important for him at this point to say something to care for his mother. Um... Why didn't Jesus make preparations before? 
I mean, Jesus was good at that. He's a miracle worker. He did, you know, why, why, why didn't he make preparations before? Why does he wait till he's on the cross? And um, I, I thought I would read you a passage uh, to remind you of how good Jesus was at uh, doing preparations. Uh, Luke chapter 22, this is preparations for the, uh, the Last Supper. When he says, as you enter, he's talking to his disciples there, and he says, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where, uh, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Uh, he will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. Isn't that great? Like, it's like uh, miraculous. He knew exactly, you know, he told him, you're going to meet this guy and this is what you're going to. Well, why didn't he make preparations like that for his mom? I mean, he could have done this ahead of time. No. Rather, he chooses to do it while he is in pain and suffering on the cross. I believe there's something that we must learn from this. I think there are two things that we need to learn. The first is we can learn about the importance of relationships in the family of God. The importance of relationships in the family of God. If you think about it a minute, why didn't Jesus ask one of his siblings to take care of their mom? Okay, I'm sorry for uh, all of you uh, with the, maybe you had a Catholic upbringing. Yes, Jesus had siblings. He had brothers, sisters. Uh, you know, uh, uh, at the Bible speaks about these brothers, so they exist. Why, why didn't he ask one of them to take care of the mother? You'll remember that these, especially these brothers, didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. You remember that? They didn't, they didn't believe. If you <clears throat> think that this rejection from his own family in regards to who he was, didn't cause pain to Jesus, you need to think again about that. Look at this passage, John chapter 7. I think, I think it's, it's, um, it's, let's just read it. It says a lot. Look, look at this. this is, After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. And then it says, kind of in parentheses, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. It's pretty sad. I think that hurts. Right? So, I think that Jesus, Jesus' unbelieving family caused him great concern and pain. And um, I can't help but believe, you know, a few, a few uh, weeks ago we talked about the criminal. Uh, today you will be with me in paradise, right? So here... I wonder if Jesus thought, here's this criminal who believes in me, the end of his life, and yet my own family that I grew up with don't believe. Do you feel that pain? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Do you get that pain from a son or a daughter, father or mother? other siblings. Now, this is the pain that Jesus now is feeling from the family that he grew up with. And he looks down at John and realizes that John now is part of his spiritual family, part of the family of God. And, and, and Jesus taught a lot about the family of God. He, he developed that idea, the family 
of God. And I think that he knew it would be important. Because of all of those who would be rejected and thrown out of mainstream society because of their belief in Christ. So it's extremely important for those people to find another family, to find a family of God. That's the context here of family of God. Jesus says in Mark chapter 3, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. 1 Timothy chapter 5, following the same idea, the early church, this is what the Apostle Paul says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. I've said this before, and uh, I'll say it again, I guess. Um, yes, you need to choose to follow Jesus for yourself. That's basically what we're saying in the family dedication, you know, that, that we, there's, you know, we can pray for protection and God bless them. And, uh, but it really, uh, as the child is brought up, Knowing the ways of the Lord, that that child makes a decision for themselves. Yes, so you need to follow Jesus for yourself, but you cannot follow Jesus by yourself. You can't do it by yourself. You need a family. You need the family of God. I think that we've made light of the family of God, especially over the last uh, few years. We, uh, you know, we have conflict uh, with others, and we just avoid them. Just avoid them. We, we, we don't bother to fix things with the family of God. Or um, we change churches. I've seen this many times, right? We change churches without even letting anybody know. Just like it's nothing, right? We just, uh, let's just go to another church. Or we get so many visitors here. We have, and Lord bless you, your visitor this morning, but we have so many visitors that come to our church looking for what services, uh, what, you know, what, uh, uh, what's in it for them. Now, what, what can I get out of this? Is, do they have something for me in this church? And uh, without realizing that this is an invitation to be part of a family. This is a family. Uh, can you hear the words of Jesus? Maybe slightly different light. This is your son. This is your daughter. This right here is your father. This is your mother. These are your siblings. This is your family, Jesus says. Take care of them. Word from the cross. God's family is important. God's family is important. We can learn something else as well. We learn that the concern that Jesus had for his mother wasn't about himself. Well, I know that's kind of obvious, right? <laughs> He's concerned for his mother. It wasn't about himself. I'm not even sure he was making a point here. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's where we should be going. But he was showing concern for his mother. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because of the suffering. Perhaps he's suffering like no other man on the face of the earth at this, this point. And yet, he has the energy and the focus to be able to feel what another person is feeling. Can you imagine that for a moment? If I was going through a fraction of the suffering that he was going through, I would probably be thinking of myself. But no, Jesus is thinking of his earthly mother and what she's going through at this moment watching him suffer in this way. Um, so again, I'm not sure that Jesus was trying to make a point 
okay, by showing concern. He was just showing concern. And the fact that he is able to show concern at this moment of the crucifixion shows the real heart and the real motive of what he is saying. That Jesus doesn't just care about solving the big issue, you know, the sin issue, the, the job of reconciling the world to himself. No, that is not only what he's concerned about. He's also concerned for the struggles that we go through on a daily basis. He's concerned about what we go through. You remember the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal son uh, basically uh, tells his dad that he needs to pretend that he's dead already. You know, be dead uh, so that I can get your money. He takes the money, he runs away, squanders it all. You know the story. He, he uh, uh, comes to himself and decides to go back home. And a father runs to meet him. And if you look at that story again for yourself, it's in several of the Gospels. Uh, you'll see that uh, there's no talk of, you know, payment for sin or restitution or even the power of forgiveness. You know, son, I forgive you. You know, there's, there isn't even a discussion about forgiveness, none of that stuff. What the, father, uh, what the father does is he attends to the wounds caused by sin and suffering. He's caring for his son. What does he do? He, he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. Basically saying, you are wanted. You are special. I want to spend time with you. He, he clothes him. He meets his material needs. I mean, obviously, he's probably looking a wreck, you know, like, let's, let's fix this up. You know, let's get you a new pair of clothes, you know, another uh, uh, set of clo clothing. You know, he gives him the, the clothes. He, he gives him a ring saying that you are important in this world. You have purpose. You have meaning. He feeds him. Yeah. If you love someone, there's going to be food. No, seriously, like if you really love someone, there's going to be great food. There has to be. That's the way we're built. That's why we have food in church. <laughs> Finally, he throws a party, throws a party for him. In other words, he, he uh, gives him back his social life. It's also really important. He gives him back a social connection with, with others. This is what the father is concerned about. Can you see the crucified Jesus telling us this morning how important the family of God is? Jesus um, by, uh, cares about the struggles that we go through. And by extension, this body... We call it the body of Christ, right? This family of God also cares about the struggles that we go through on a daily uh, basis. You remember this verse, Romans chapter 2? It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Not the law of God. Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, being hit over the head because we sinned. Uh, not because of, you know, God being great and awesome and all of this. No, it's, it's because of his kindness towards us. It's that that leads us to repentance before God. It's your kindness. It's because you stood there while you were suffering and thought about me. This is your mother. This is your son. I have... Um, what I will call a congregational reading that I'd like us to do together. I just chose a few passages of Scripture to remind us of some of the important um, facts about the family of God, <coughs> about what Jesus has done for us. And I would like it if we all did this together, if we could stand together 
and read together these passages. Um, maybe, I, I don't know what you uh, got out of this sermon. I mean, it could be kind of all over the place, uh, you know, from carrying the importance of caring for parents, uh, but the importance of this family, the family of God, and to treat it as important and to care for one another. Or maybe it's a realization of the kindness of Jesus, that he cares not only about the sin issue, but he also cares about me, about my struggles, about my hardships, about what I've been through, my sicknesses, and so on. He cares for that. This Jesus is for you. He died for you this morning. This is a moment where we can kind of rededicate ourselves to the idea of relationship in the family of God. So let's read this uh, together. Dima will uh, go, uh, go from passage to passage. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. You Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these fantastic people that are here in front of me this morning. I pray that you pour your blessings upon them this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Especially, I thank you for the words that were recorded, that you said from the cross. I believe those words are really important for us to understand your heart and what is most important. And Lord, we want to underline the importance this morning of your family, of your family. Lord, this is your son. This is your father. These are our siblings. These are our parents. Lord, I pray that you would renew a passion in our heart for the family of God. Lord, I pray that you would also renew a sense of under, understanding how great is your love, and how great is your forgiveness towards us. Lord, it is, it is this kindness that we have been trying to describe this morning that draws us to you, that draws us to repent, to turn away from our sins. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Lord, I leave this word 